afternoon, boys and girls. Welcome to this Saturday afternoon. Kids drive with us on National Geographic. My name is Steve. I'm joined by Davisito on camera. And, well, it is a wonderful afternoon out here. And we are very excited to have you on board. So, please, if you have any questions or comments, ask your parents or teachers or guardians or grandparents, whoever you might be sitting with there, to just send them through to Kids at wildearth.tv. And hopefully we can answer them for you and put your name on the screen. So we are heading down south towards a very big watering hole called Chitwa Chitwa, where no doubt we're going to find some hippopotamuses and many other wonderful animals. It is our winter months, so this is the time of year. Ooh, what have we got? We've got some tracks. We've got some tracks of nothing that important. This is old hyena track that was moving in and out. We look in the sand all the time for tracks of animals that are moving around. And uh, I'm not the only one out this afternoon. There's others that are out as well that are going to be searching for some tracks as well. They're going to be sticking around this area while I head down to the watering hole because what we know about animals, they have to go and drink. So if you're just patient and you spend some time you never know what you might find because we are on a live game drive and the bush, we call this area, the bush is unpredictable and absolutely anything can be around the corner. Absolutely anything. So we're keeping our head left to right, looking at the ground. There is a beautiful bird that has just flown up into the bottom of this tree. It is the most photographed bird in the Kruger National Park. It is a lilac-breasted roller. Hello. Now, a bird is so colourful that it almost looks like it has been given to a child, a black and white sort of draw-in colour, and has been asked to draw it in. And that is the colour of a lilac-breasted roller. There's a... Oh, we've got one flying above us here. There are blues and purples and blacks. Oh, he's just dive-bombed. The reason why they call them a roller is when they are fighting each other, they come, oh, we caught something. They catch insects in the air. They are aerial insect catchers. They also plop down on the ground and catch things as well. But when they're fighting over nesting areas or territory, they go up into the air and they actually dive bomb like a big Spitfire plane would sort of roll through the sky, wings going left, right, left, right. And there's quite something to see, although it is not the breeding season now, so they won't really be doing any of that at the moment. But you never know, it could happen. There he goes again. Hello, Michelle, this is your favourite bird. Well, let's see what he, he's going to do. Watch him. Now, if he was going to roll, he would be making lots of noises. And they fly around in circles, and then they do a dip. Oh, he's doing a dip. Oh, he's just catching. He's looking for food right now. Wow, look how he uses those wings. Beautiful. Now you can see the colors. There is the lilac on the breast, sort of maroon and turquoise on the body. There's a bit of bright blue. There's some white. There's green on his head. It is the most ridiculous combination of colors, but it works beautifully. For Oh, hello. He just opened his mouth. I can't tell you if it's a male or female. They do look identical. It's probably two of them here that are a sort of bre breeding group. Linda looks like he's been coloured with... What pants did you hear that, Dave? Fluffy gel, Fluffy gel pants. Pink. <laughs> I'm not quite sure, Linda. <laughs> Sparkly gel. I still don't even know what, what you're trying to say to me, Faith. <laughs> it's beyond my vocabulary, whatever the words you are saying there. Sparkly. <laughs> We're just going to move on, shall we? And, oh, Davy, you got it again. There we go. Look at those beautiful colours. 
Okay, so the most photographed bird in the Greater Kruger National Park, the lilac breasted roller. And as I said before, I am not the only one out on safari. Lauren is bumbling around somewhere and she would like to say good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I am indeed bumbling around as well to see what we can find out here in the wilderness. My name is Lauren and on camera today I have Senzo and got my jumper on ready for a little bit of a chilly night ahead. It has been a fantastically cold day today and yet we have to bump into some animals for you all. So we have taken the western side of the reserve different side from where Steve is at and we're just trying to see if we can find anything exciting. Now I do have one thing to say so lots of kids are watching but there's a kid in particular I just want to say happy birthday to Tesla who turned nine yesterday and Tesla was a big supporter of Dive Live and she's a huge fan of Safari Live so happy birthday. Okay, I'm just going to decide where to go. I think I'm going to go down this way. And you can also let us know what you would like to see today. And of course, we will do our very best to try and find it. Although sometimes when the animals don't want to be found, it is not easy. But we will obviously try our best. Like Steve was saying, the bush is very unpredictable. You never know what you're going to see around the next corner. Sometimes it's big animals from elephants. Sometimes it's really small animals. Ellen is hoping to see a giraffe. Oh, I would love to see a giraffe too. I actually saw one yesterday for the first time in a very long time. I love giraffes. So I will keep my eye open for them, but it's not difficult because they are rather large, but I will keep a special eye just for you, Ellen, and see if we can find anything from little to large. There's a lot of squirrels and mongoose around at the moment. Now this is a rather bumpy path. Are you ready, Sins? It's gonna be some bumps getting over here. There we go, that wasn't too bad. I'm trying to be nice to my cameraman today. Oh! Jenny's asking, because it is so dry, which it is, so winter months here, how do the animals get water? Well, there is still some water points around. There's actually one over here right now, so I'm just having a look to see if anything is around. And Steve will shortly be at one of the biggest dams that we have around here called Chippa. So unfortunately, a lot of the dams are dry up because it is winter. there is no rains there are some small water pans that are permanently filled up with water so the animals can still come and drink even for months so good question Jane. obviously next summer when water again if not the animals they can all get water which actually makes it believe it or not, that makes it a little bit more tricky for the animals myself. So if you are on the main drive as a winter, to go to the water holes and find out. So it looks like I'm going to give it a little bit of a signal, so we're going to send it back across to Steve. Sorry about Lauren's gremlins. We've just um, met up with someone along the road who's given us very interesting information. There's a male leopard that we know of that we think is not what it is, and we've just been given some information from one of the other game vehicles that he might have saw him yesterday. So we're going to drive up the road here. We were already on the road that... Um, telling us to check but we've just got to go a few blocks up here to see if we can find this male leopard so 
I'm going to drive very slowly to see if you can find any tracks on the ground because that is the best way to drive it. Sometimes, actually, sometimes they actually um, just jump out in front of us. It's always very nice. But sometimes you've actually got to put a lot of effort to their track. So what we do, we spend a lot of time these animals and we also use the radio to communicate with everybody so we've just had a few by up in the north that one of their kids have been on the radio for the last five minutes telling everybody to come help them. They've got a broken wall. and there's a leopard come and help us we don't know where so everybody's trying to help them don't know where they are and now I've just heard their mummy saying, sorry about that, my child got hold of the radio. So, <laughs> it was quite funny. It's quite funny. Hello, hello, please come help us. We've got a broken tire and there's a leopard, yeah? <laughs> very cute. Very cute. Very, very cute. But um, the radio here can allow us to talk to everybody around so we can help each other. So if I find tracks over here, I can tell someone where they're going and they can check that side. Or if they find something, they can call us. Hello, Sharon. You want to know if we'll see lions? Well, I would love to find you lions, Sharon. But um, there were no lions found this morning. Um, unless I'm very lucky and I come across some tracks and find them for you, we might not find them until closer to sunset. Because both lions and leopards uh, generally aren't that active in the daytime. Uh, waiting for the cover of darkness and the coolness that darkness brings before they start moving. But you never know, as I said, you never know what lies around the corner. And Sharon, if we do find some lines, they'll be dedicated to you this afternoon. How does that sound? Very good. And we're going to keep heading up this road. This road kind of runs along our southern sort of boundary and anything could walk across. It's a little bit... A little bit fresh that's not the warmest of days so you never know animals could be moving in this temperature okay well while we move along here looking for some tracks to hopefully find your leopard my good friend Tristan is doing similar things to us let's go and say good afternoon to him Indeed. Hello, everybody. As Stephen mentioned, my name is Tristan on camera. I've got Craig this afternoon, and we are also doing what Steve is doing in the form of looking for some tracks to see if there's actually any sign of any animals moving around. So far, we saw a very, very old leopard track for a female. It looks like it was from maybe yesterday morning or maybe even the night before. So no fresh sign where we've seen so far. But now is the time of the day where a lot of our cats will move around. It's a fairly cool afternoon. There's a bit of a sort of bite to the wind. And so maybe, just maybe, we're going to start to see our cats moving a little bit earlier than they have been over the course of, you know, the summer periods or even the last few days where it's been a bit warmer. So that's the hope, and we'll see how we go. We're going to just basically kind of check all the areas where we know our leopards generally like to move around as well as any other animals like elephants or those kind of things so water holes is a good place to check and then any big pathways that potentially are around um, those are always excellent areas to have a look so there's actually a dam that's coming up just to our right hand side now called Tamboerti Dam it's to the north of where we can drive um, but it's a good place to just check for the movement of animals because often you get tracks going up and down here Deborah you're asking about Hosanna and what are the chances Hosanna will come back given that he went off to back to Londolozi and down that side um, so Deborah mm, I'm not sure I mean there is every chance that he can come back it's not far and if he were to decide to come back it would take him only two or three days to get back here in fact not even maybe a day if he walked as fast as he can do from where he is now um, but the reason why I don't think he's going to be back anytime soon is twofold firstly the pressure that he received when he arrived back here 
was not very good at all. He had a lot of pressure from Lion and from Leopard. So Tingana's response to him was not as favorable as what it was the last time um, he was here. And so maybe he just felt a bit more pressurized and therefore didn't want to come back um, or didn't want to stick around. Uh, the fact that there's lots of Lions is also not ideal for any little Leopard. But um, what the major cause and why we're actually seeing so much competition between these cats is because where he hung around was around the dam cam. Now the dam cam has pumped water and so that's one of the few places in this whole area that's pumping water and that has actually got water. The whole of Juma is drying out. Most of the water holes don't have much left and so the competition around that water source is very, very high. When you travel further west and I was there yesterday during the afternoon very close to where Hosanna was seen, in fact, actually exactly where Hosanna was seen. And um, that area, the, the riverbed there is absolutely filled with uh, water. So there's lots and lots of water there, which means there's a lot more opportunity for him to sit at water points and find animals without as much competition. Also, the game that is around there, there's going to be a lot more um, prey species because essentially, they can find more water there and, and better grazing. So that's why we're not gonna see it. There's an elephant as well, Craig, which we'll get to now. But on the road, just going here, is a track for a lion. Now, unfortunately, these are lions that have probably left our area and we're probably from this last night or this morning, um, but you can see it, that's the track over there. You can see the toes where my fingers are and the back of his pad behind. So that's the lion's footprint that is moving off in a northerly direction. So that's the kind of tracks that we're looking for, but unfortunately these are heading the wrong way. Right, let's go catch up with these Ellies because this looks like a really nice herd that's crossing onto our side. We haven't seen Ellies in a few days. Well, at least I haven't seen any Ellies at all. And so poor Hosanna basically getting back to that is means that that side there, he's got food, he's got water and less competition because of the amount of water. So it just seems better. So Firefly, you say you, it seems that Hosan is not fitting in anywhere. Will he push further and further away? Well, that's what happens with young male leopards. It's quite a cool view from up here because we're a little bit higher from up here. It's a nice big herd. Look at the size of this herd and how many Ellies there are. Very, very cool. Um, but Hosanna, that's what happens with young male leopards is they move and move and move until such time as they actually can find a place where they feel like they can settle down and there's not too much competition. Londolozi is not really an area that's great for that. There's a lot of um, male leopards that side, which is going to make life very tricky for him um, in some respects. And, and we might see him push further afield like Tumba did when he headed further west. Um, what also is to remember, and probably Sindile is a really good case study for this, is when Sindile was collared and he was dropped off back in the Sabi Sands after his little quarantine period, he went on these sort of roaming circles. Now, it's a little bit of a different situation, not quite the same as what we're talking about with Osana, but if you think about it, when he was collared, his first kind of movement around where he was let go was very, very small. And slowly those circular movements that he was doing to return back to where he was born got larger and larger and larger. And eventually when the collar was taken off, he was covering huge amounts of distance as a young male leopard. And you think of Hukamuri and where hukamuri has gone as a, as a male leopard and how far he's traveled. It gives you an idea of just how far these guys can move. So potentially, yes, he could potentially also turn around and come back and he's here tomorrow and spends another, you know, 10 years here. It's very difficult to say. Uh, he's got a lot of things that he's got to try and kind of overcome in order to become a dominant male wherever it may be. But isn't that a beautiful view of a herd? It's very seldom here at Juma we get this kind of view of Ellie's through the bush. Uh, generally, because of the density of the thickets, you need to be quite close to them to see them. So it's quite nice to actually be where the fire break is and you can kind of see and it's that soft afternoon winter light with those colors of the leaves that are oranges and reds and greens. Absolutely beautiful when you look at it in this way. Well, I think so anyway. Craig, should we get a little bit closer now? Maybe we should before they do get into the thicket because they're moving towards the thicket. What they're actually going to be doing is they're going to be heading slowly southwards towards water. So we'll follow them all the way along. Chris, why don't we see more collared leopards? Well, it's simply because there's very few people that are studying leopard uh, that require a collar on them at the moment, uh, particularly in this ecosystem. The Sabi Sands doesn't collar any of their leopards because they can rely more on citizen science for things. They don't actually need collars. Um, with trackers and off-roading and relaxed and habituated leopard, it means most of the leopards in this area are pretty much accounted for. 
Also, being an area where it attracts photographic tourism, a collar on a leopard is not really what people want to see when they photograph an animal. You know, a lot of people are coming here to photograph wildlife, not animals that have some sort of human um, element to them in the form of a collar. So that's part of it. And then, like I said, there's no one really researching the movement of, of leopards via collars, and it can be done via camera traps, which is far less intrusive into a leopard's life. Uh, ultimately, those collars, most of the ones that are around at the moment, only last for about a year to two years, and then they've got to be replaced. And so it's a, quite an intrusive thing to constantly having to dart a leopard to replace his collar battery or those kind of things. Um, where are our Ellie's going to pop out? I think they're going to come out a little bit further in front of us, Craig. So let's go a little bit further forward. Let's have a look here. It's not ideal because the light is directly kind of behind these guys. So, Giraffe, what other leopards are in the area where Hosane currently is sitting at the moment? So, in terms of male leopards, there's three males that potentially would be of competition to him, possibly four, but the three would be the three main ones would be Anderson, Hukumuri, Flat Rock male, um, and then there's another male called Tortoise Pan male, which potentially could be fairly close to where Hosane is. So, those would be the male leopards. Um, and Tumba um, is another one. So Tumba could be in direct competition with Hosanna at some point. And then females-wise, around him there would be Tiani, <coughs> uh, Moya, uh, Makamsava. Um, I forget what Moya's... I mean, yeah, Moya's... No, Ingrid Dam female's last um, cub was called. So let me just try and see... Somebody did send me the name. I'm just trying to find it quickly. Also, I've just got a report. Um, Faith, there's anyone, if you can ask maybe Steve or Lauren if they are near the Muluwanini Chitwe area, because apparently Tandi has just been sighted in the Muluwanini moving around towards Chitwe. So if anybody's around there, it might be a good idea to head that direction fairly quickly and try and see if they can find. Now, I'm trying to find the name of this little female. Um, sorry, guys, I'm a bit distracted, I know, but I'm just trying to find the name of what her what it was, she, ah, Shinzele, that's her name. So that's Ingrid Dam's little daughter. And so those would be the rough kind of leopards. I mean, there's obviously gonna be others, uh, also Insele uh, would also be around there. And if Insele has any offspring. And I'm just trying to get an update also on Tandi. Apparently she's got, because Ali is driving around, she says she's got a fat belly and she just crossed the Muluwanini. So let me just let the guys know also on the radio. So give me two seconds. Tax, tax, or Aubrey coming. Because the guys were tracking a female leopard in Torchwood, which I'd imagine would be her. Yeah, tax, there's reports of um, Tandi in the Muluanini around Gari main area. Um, maybe just try to jump on the Eastern Channel and get an update there. Right, so now we've done our duty, we can actually focus on the early. So there's quite a few leopards around Hosanna at the moment. Um, a lot of male leopard there, big male leopards that could easily chase him. I mean, Hukumuri, Anderson and Flat Rock are all big, big, um, you know, individuals. And his ability to defend himself from those is probably not going to be great. So there's going to be pressure on him. But we'll see. Maybe he's going to be back, like I say, in two days' time and sit here again for another you know, six months, it's obviously always a bit tricky to know exactly what's going on with these cats, and, and I think time will tell, and I, probably because it's so dry in Juma, I actually don't think we're going to see much of him at all. I think it's going to be much easier for him to survive further to the southwest. Good, we're going to carry on with our eddies. We'll try and stay with them as much as possible. They are heading down towards Gari Dam and um, Gallego Pan, which will probably take them a good half an hour to 45 minutes at the rate that they're walking, maybe a bit longer. So we'll try to keep up with them. In the meantime, though, let's send you across to Steve, who I believe has been tracking and has found something of interest. Thank you, Tristan. Well, the reports you were given were of a male leopard into Juma yesterday. And I found the tracks. And they've gone straight in north towards one of our watering holes called Treehouse Dam. Now, I can't really tell you the difference between male leopards, uh, but you can definitely tell the difference between a male and a female. And uh, there's a size difference in the foot, of course. Just like most men, 
have got bigger feet than most women. All leopards have generally got males who have got bigger feet than females. Just the way it is. It's only about a centimetre, centimetre and a half. But that's enough to measure. And they were pretty fresh, but uh, the person we saw said that he saw that individual yesterday around lunchtime coming from the south. And now Tristan is telling everyone hosanna has gone south. But uh, this guy assures me he saw Hosanna yesterday at lunchtime. So I don't really know. I know Tristan knows leopards very well. And the guy who saw them, I can't really vouch for, for the valid validity of it. But we are going to check anyway, because if it is Hosanna, the little chief, he is my favorite leopard. And he's very cool. He is a very cool leopard. And he's got some very familiar sort of places that he goes to and very familiar pathways that he uses. But we are a whole day and a half behind him, which means we're going to need a little bit of luck. Hello, Jujik. The Evokers uh, crossed straight across Juma this morning into the north. And the reports I've been told without any photographic evidence is that at least one of the Nkuma lionesses has got cubs. Uh, but we reckon there's probably four of them that are potentially ready. But I haven't seen them, so I can't. You got, you got a birdie there, Darby. You got him. Where's he? It's gone. There he is. Whoopsie. Dip, dip, dip. What are you, little fella? If it sits still for a second, I'll be able to tell you what it is. Oh, I think it's a scrub robin. Chip, 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 chip. Oh, I can't tell you. Can't tell you. Okay. A couple more birdies. It's a nice thing to do when you stop and uh, what the, there we go that's a chagra that one that is called the brown crowned chagra and they're very skulking they jump around looking for insects in the undergrowth and that one oh that looks like a prinia hello tawny flanked a prinia oops very quick very very quick most of the birds you're seeing now are insect eaters and they, some of them will go through the bushes looking for insects and others will wait on the side waiting for the insects to fly away. And when they do fly away, then they catch them, capitalizing and eating food in a time when it is almost very unavailable. But anyway, quickly, let's go to Lauren. She has got another bird for you. We have a gorgeous sight in front of us right now. We have an almost full moon, 96.6% according to my moon app on my phone, which you can clearly see it's almost full. And we have two large raptors sitting at the top of the tree here. And both Senzo and I are discussing the ID of these raptors because we can't, we're quite far, we're at quite a distance. It's way, way off ahead of us. And although Senzo will get us closer, we're still trying to work out exactly what large birds these are perched up on the tree here. So help us out. Tell us what you think. Well, this one is hiding itself a little bit, not giving the best view. Oh, there we go. Hello. Who are you? And you can see it's using its beak here to have a really good scratch, itch, ruffle its feathers. Now, I think I know which bird I... I'm going to go for, but tell us. Let's have a discussion on which raptor you all think we have here. We have two of them. Both of them perched at the end of a tree, very high up. Both of them preening. And we did earlier, a few minutes ago, hear an alarm sort of call coming from one of them. It obviously spotted something and was screeching loudly. But now it's gone back to adjusting its feathers, shall we say. Now you can see the feathers go all the way down the leg, right to the foot. And that means that's a sign that it's a true eagle. Little bit said eagle owl, 
I think that was what Faith just said. Um, no, I don't think it's an eagle owl. I'm afraid this is definitely a true eagle of some sort. Oh, we have Jessica saying it's... I'm just going to turn my game drive radio down. I have a lot of people talking in my ear right now. It's very distracting. Um, an African snake eagle, was that what you said? Hawk eagle, sorry, sorry, my bad. Senzo just reminded me. And no, I don't personally feel it is, but I do see where you're going with that. I've got my book out, so I was just going to show you. If Senzo could maybe come back here... King Cod said it's a snake eagle. Now, it's definitely not a snake eagle because they are not true eagles. They do not have feathers going all the way down the back of their head. So we just had a suggestion of an African hawk eagle, number two. So that would be one of these two birds. So it would be the ones in the middle. You have two different versions here. And I don't believe it is the African hawk the eagle. So I just wanted to show you because these are the suggestions that are coming in. There we go. That would be the African hawk eagle. So really good idea, but I do not feel that is the one. So let's, we'll get Senzo to go back and we'll try and pick out some identification features here. Good job, Sens. What's one of them doing? I think probably the one that's higher up is possibly giving us the best view here out of all of them. It's definitely not a marshal. So a number of people are saying Tony Eagle. And yes, I think we're getting along the right track now. So... Are you ready to come back, Sens? <laughs> I'm really giving them hard work today. In and out and in and out. So I think we're getting along the right track now. And these were the two suggestions that I would have went for. Two and three. Step Eagle or Tony Eagle would have been from this distance without my camera, my binos or anything would have been the ones that I went for. So the Tony Eagle's down at the bottom here. And, well, all four of them actually are different versions of the Tony Eagle at different ages. And up here, we just go a little bit up, Sense the step eagle is quite an identification feature of the step eagle is actually the fact that the gape, so the mouth, the sort of orangey yellow part, extends very far back, almost to a point that's level with the back of the eye, if you can just see that there. So once you look at that feature of a raptor or an eagle, it's quite easy to work out if it's a step or not. Now, unfortunately, that's the tricky part. These raptors are very very far in front of us so i am wondering sens and i were discussing if we drive further around if we're going to get a better view of that tree and it's possible that we might we just wanted to capture the moon for you as well because it's so beautiful so let's do that let's drive ahead and see if just when we come around this corner here if we can actually get a better view of these birds get a little bit closer to pick out those features but it definitely is a true eagle. Eagles that are not classified as true eagles, the feathers don't go all the way down the leg to the foot. They do have feathers on the leg, they just don't go all the way around. Okie dokie. I'm gonna aim for just up here. Senzo will be able to do it, I know we will. I just hope there's enough gap in the vegetation to do it. Right, Sens. Can we get it from here? He's saying yes. So I think this will be a closer view. Still far, but definitely closer than we were. So here they are, just a slightly different angle. Fabulous, Sins. Look at that. Gorgeous. Now you can see the, the gape of the beak really does extend quite far back. If you just look at that orangey part of the beak that goes right back almost to the back of the eye. Oh, why did you just turn away from me? <laughs> I'm trying to point out that one feature of you and of course the bird turns around right on cue. And we can't really 
see it on that one. But in my opinion, it does stand quite far back to the edge of the mouth. So I am going to go with Step Eagle, I think. But thank you all for your particip participation there. I can't even speak. It was an awesome guessing game from all. So we're going to keep bumbling on and let these birds be. And while we do that, we're going to send you across to Tristan. Good luck, Lauren. Unfortunately, I tried to call Lauren on the radio to try and tell her where Tanya is, but her radio is not working, so Chitwa is where she needs to go, basically. The drainage line off Chitwa. But anyway, we're still with um, this Ellie herd and just really enjoying the fact that we can sit with some Ellies again. It's been so long that I've sat with a nice herd of Ellies that it's been very pleasant just to sit here and listen to the sounds of them feeding and groaning and doing their thing. They're not the most relaxed herd I've been around. Um, I find with them, they, the females in particular, there's a certain distance to which they are happy and then they start to react a little bit and you know start to change their behavior slightly and start to end up kind of turning and stop feeding. So we're trying to keep a little bit of a distance. This is female here. Can you hear her talking? So she's, she's okay, she's not too bad to be close to, but the rest of them with the small little ones, because there's quite a few tiny babies in this herd, they're a little bit more shy. And as we move, they, they kind of move with, with the adults. And so there's the main part of the herd is in front of us, and we're just at the back with the kind of stragglers at this stage. What's interesting about this herd so far is that I haven't noticed too many young boys. Generally with a herd of this size, there's normally a couple teenage boys that are lingering towards the back end and they kind of mill about and do their thing and they're normally causing trouble. But this particular herd seems to be mostly mothers with their young ones. Um, and when I say young ones, mostly quite small. Um, it doesn't seem to be too many sort of 13, 14 year old boys that are milling about. It looks like most of the elephants that are in this group are under 10 years of age that are not adults, so interesting kind of herd structure, but beautiful, beautiful animals, aren't they? So, Rafaela, it depends on where the elephant is as to how old it will get. In um, parts of the world where it's like this, where it's a lot of wood and, and a lot of thick areas, the elephants tend to weigh down their teeth much faster. And so what you'll see from Ellie's is generally in this area, we'll live to about 50 to 55 years, extreme case, maybe about 60. Whereas elephants that are in areas with a much softer diet, so more grasses, reeds, that are not digging up roots and tubers and, and, and eating bark, those ellies typically will live a little bit longer, so more around 60 years old as an average. And then there's ellies that will live in places like zoos, which I suppose are not really living, but have been put in places like zoos. And, those elephants, because of the controlled nature of their diet and the fact that they eat pellets and they're looked after and there's dental work done on them, those ellies can survive as much as 90 years old. So very, very similar lifespan to what people um, live. You know, we, most you know, most of us will, you know, are quite happy if you get to 90 years old. That's a good innings for, for all of us. Um, and so for an ellie, it's, it's about that as well. But like I say, that's only in extreme cases where they're getting veterinary care and their teeth are getting looked after. And I say teeth because teeth is really the, the sort of limiter of an elephant's age in many respects. Unfortunately for Ellie's is because they have a very abrasive diet, their teeth get worn down very, very quickly. And so they have these, these six sets of teeth that roll forward on a, uh, basically on a set of tracks almost, if you want to call it that. And, and once that last set is gone, they don't produce any more teeth after that. And so for these guys at, at 90 years old, that's because they've had like I say, dental care, they've been fed a very soft diet, which has meant that they haven't had to worry too much at all about wearing those teeth down. But out here in the wild, like I say, about 50, 55 years in the Kruger system, um, in parts of East Africa and, and softer vegetation, maybe like the Delta, you find a lot of those Ellie's, will probably go a little bit longer to maybe 60, 65, but not much more than that, I'm afraid, um, in the wild systems. But I'm going to try to see it. It's quite nice to see them all kind of scattered along the road. Isn't it pretty? It's a very wintry scene, isn't it? A dry grass and there's a few kind of different tones to the vegetation, but so pleasant just to be in amongst them. I'm going to try to go forward a little bit just to try and see if we can 
kind of get a bit of a better view of some of them. There's some small little babies that are around, um, not much smaller than the one that's next to the road, a tiny little one that's inside this. Let's see if we can get it. It's going very, very, very slowly because I don't want to disturb them at all. Leah, often elephants will have disagreements um, in between each other or in the herd system. Um, often there's young ones that are a little bit boisterous with each other and then they'll fight with one another or there'll be a situation where, okay, my girl, okay, it's fine, we'll stop here. Don't need to move any further. Um, otherwise, there, or there'll be a thing where maybe a little calf wants to suckle and wants to get milk and mom's not letting that calf get milk. So you'll do get disagreements and when you have a disagreement, generally it's accompanied by an incredible scream that an elephant can make. It's a sound that is deafening if you're close by, uh, very, very loud, and sometimes a little bit of trumpeting, but mostly that screaming and then lots of grumbles that will take place. So it's this deep sound that we heard just now. Um, those are often kind of indications of a little bit of a disagreement amongst each other. And the other thing that gets that gets an elephant herd going and, and causing trouble amongst them is when bulls arrive en masse. If a female's in heat and lots of bulls around, then, then the herd gets a bit jittery and they can be quite testy and pushy and they'll push each other around a little bit and then you see it. But generally with the adult females, not too much of a, a disagreement takes place unless it's inter-herd interaction. So in a dry period, they come across a resource that is very, very little of it. And then you'll find two herds might have a little bit of a go at each other and females might have a, a bit of a sort of kind of dispute. But females from the same herd, very, very seldom. So it's more the little ones that cause the, the disagreements and disputes in the elephant grouping. Um, and, and kind of, that's where most of the noise comes from. There's the little one. So you see it's coming out? Hello, little one. Tiny, tiny, tiny small area and that's why they're being so kind of defensive of where we are it's because of that small baby um, so you can see I as I was driving I get to a point where they're happy feeding 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 and then all of a sudden they'll stop feeding and they'll turn and, and their head comes up and that's a very clear indication to you as a person to stop where you are they don't want you any closer um, and you have to respect that and you have to just slow down and stop where you are and then you can see that they are absolutely relaxed once you do that so Ellen, you say, what does it feel like to be so close, uh, and and what are, am I, and am I scared? So, Ellen, I think there's two parts to that question. Uh, the first part is I'll deal with the scared aspect of it. Um, so, no, I don't feel scared at all. Um, is the one spent a lot of time around elephants, and so um, I, I, you know, I try and be as respectful as possible to them, give them as much space as that they need as, in order to be comfortable. Um, so it's very important to pay attention to their behavior, make sure that as long as you're around, as long as they're still feeding and they're doing their own thing, then you're all right. So no, not scared, because these elephants have shown no aggression towards me whatsoever. They have been very, very comfortable about feeding, and when I've gotten to the point where they don't want me to go further, they've shown me very quickly, and we immediately stop and turn off. So there's no fear there, because these elephants, well, they're not fearing me, and then therefore there's no reason for me to be fearful of them. They're just doing their own thing, and we can do our own thing. Um, what it's like to be around elephants like this is one of the most magical things in the whole world. Um, it's something that I wish every single person could experience once in their lifetime is to sit in amongst a wild herd of Ellie's. Not so much from a visual point of view. Visual, visually, it's, it's breathtaking to see these massive animals right next to you that dwarf your car. But it's more the, the smell and the sound and the, the general feeling that you get around being, well, being around elephants. And there was a, there's some talk and, and people that are looking into these things at the moment. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to leave these eddies now and go around and catch them on the other side because otherwise chasing after them through thick bushes is not going to be ideal. But there's a lot of sort of work going into studying what elephants do to you when you're around them. And what I mean by that is that they, oh, hello little diker. What are you doing on the road? It's a very odd animal to have walking in the road. It's probably flushed by the Ellies, and we've kind of bumped into it. Sorry, little diker. The big and the small. So back to our Ellies, uh, basically what I was saying is that th they emit a frequency of sound that is very, very low frequency. Now, they say that that frequency of sound triggers people to release the chemical endorphins. So even though we can't hear it and process that sound and make out what it's saying or what it means our body is still 
picking it up and those endorphins are released and it's basically you then start to feel a little happier and you're more euphoric and it's much like dolphins too so swimming with dolphins is a very similar thing and so it's why there is i don't know when you sit around elephants for me there's just this absolute happiness and this amazement that takes place you smell the smells of elephants breaking branches picking up grass and the dust that comes up from that um, they also have a very specific smell when they often because they go into the toilet but they they dung and everything about them has this very specific kind of smell to it and then just the sounds the grumblings the trumpeting the all those kind of things and and them moving around you through their environment with leaves scraping on their skin and and those kind of things really just it kind of carries you away to a magical place where there seems like nothing else in the world and you can forget about all your problems and forget about any worries that you have and it just kind of transports you to a place where you get lost in wilderness and I think that's very very special I think in modern day world where we so caught up in all of the things that go on and the stress of work and family and getting by and these kind of things um, I think being able to be carried away in a moment like that um, into a place where you you're not thinking about those things and you're allowed yourself to connect with nature is very special and I find Ellie's is one of the few animals that can do that to you and really kind of take you to that place so that's for me how it feels I mean some people are different there's some people that are absolutely petrified of being anywhere near an elephant and have reasons for that but for me it's it's very nice just to be around them and I think it, it creates a sense of calmness and happiness when you sit and see these animals particularly also because of the persecution that they've had over all the years in many areas of Africa Anyway, it's not just me that thinks that. Most guys, or particularly part of the Wild Earth team, feels very strongly... Little baby Dyker. I thought for a second it was something else. <laughs> baby Dyker ran away. Um, it's not just me that feels very strongly about Ellie's. There's a lot of others, us that do. And, well, Steve, he also really likes Ellie's. And so let's go see what he thinks about spending time in an elephant herd. Thanks, Tristan. Yes, well, we found fresh tracks, we think, of that male leopard that went to the dam, had a drink, and then has come back in this direction. Um, just trying to check this sort of pathway here. When you look at sandy soil like this, it's a really nice area to look for tracks. And because uh, animals will walk across here, it's impossible for them to cross a pathway without leaving some mark on the ground. So just double checking that we haven't missed anything here. Um, but I think that someone missed those tracks earlier because they got driven over and that makes it difficult to know whether it went left or right of the road. So I'm just checking that they haven't come out. They haven't come out because we found those tracks earlier over here heading that direction. So maybe my leopard gone in there, he's caught himself some food, he's gone to drink and has come back again. These things could happen. These things could definitely happen. Just going to have another little look around. I'd love to be able to find you, whoever this male leopard might be. Tristan assures me it can't be Hosanna. I do believe him. I won't stake my name against any. A track is a track. A leopard is a definitely a male or a female. Can't get confused between the two. Just a little bit of size difference, as I said before. We do have one other vehicle who's going to come and join us looking around there because I think they feel a little bit guilty because they seem to have driven on those tracks, but they do have expert trackers with them as well. So I doubt they would have missed it. Uh, maybe it was this morning that it got driven on. Not difficult, though, to miss a track if someone's driven over it. Imagine just a small little paw print you can quite easily... <laughs> Everybody, I have absolutely no idea who it could be. Chances are it's probably the skittish male, probably the skittish male leopard who's hanging around and then phew, chances of finding him. Skittish means if he sees the guy, he runs away. So hopefully it's not him, but we've just got to check all these little pathways coming through and coming across because you never know. The art of tracking is a science, and if you find one track, you find the and there's a pathway as you start moving you'll see that okay where's the animal going to go is he going to go through the tree or around the tree 
always around, isn't it? And if you know where the water is, that's why we go check the water because these animals have to go and drink. And so if you know where the water is, and you have an idea of the movements of the animal, they've got to move in response to that. So I don't have any leopard tracks coming through here. I have a feeling it's probably inside the block we've just come from. So let's go have another look over there. Ooh, I can smell the potato bush. It smells like between boiled and fried potatoes, that really lovely smell you get when you come home and mum's been cooking potatoes in the oven. Hello, Bill. You want to know if I'm frightened being on foot? Well, no, Bill. I mean, the thing is, is that you have to be very aware when you get out of here. And always we have a little look around before we just jump out. We don't just jump out of the car. We're always very aware of what's going on. Um, and yes, there is potential dangers, but I'm more afraid of getting out of my car in Johannesburg than I am getting out of the car here. Because uh, animals are predictable. And uh, obviously, if you jump out of the car, in the middle of an elephant breeding herd, that's just going to be silly. And if you jump out of the car in the middle of a lion pride, well, once again, that's also going to be very silly. So you shouldn't do that. But if you jump out of the car here and you're aware of what's going on and you're always looking and listening, then you should be fine. But we've also have been through lots and lots of training uh, to get me to this point. But I feel much safer out in the African bush than I do in any big city, to be honest with you. People are unpredictable and sneaky. Yes, I suppose some animals here want to eat me, but um, we, I'm not seeing as their natural food source. And if I'm careful and I don't cross the natural boundaries, then I should be fine. Should be fine. Well, Texan, one of the guards, just drove past us. He's got one of his trackers with him. So we're going to go have a chat with him now and see if he thinks the tracks we found are legit. You might tell me I'm talking nonsense, but they looked very, very, what we say, mutle, which means very good. Very mutle tracks. Mutle and gonzo. Beautiful, nice tracks. So we're going to scratch around in this block here. We might find a leopard on foot. Shari G, I have no idea about what's happening with the male leopard, the skittish male leopard, if he's going to be named. Um, it's really out of my sort of department. I can bring, I think Tristan is the man to ask that question to. Um, I wouldn't attempt to try and add any sort of input towards that. Uh, I know there's a process that it needs to go through and the Juma guides need to be a part of it, but um, I, I don't think that process has started. We, I was the, I'm the only one to get him on camera the last two times. So, and it wasn't for very long. We do have identification of it. We know what it looks like. But um, yet he doesn't have a name. Uh, if he establishes a bit of a territory and we're able to follow him and calm him down, maybe he gets a kill and we find him with a kill or he gets a mating relationship, then we could quite easily then uh, give him a name. But if we need to ask anybody that, Tristan Dix is definitely the person to ask. He's been here long enough, longer than me anyway. So let's go ask him exactly how the process is going to work for the Skittish male leopard. Well, generally for naming of any animals, it's normally the guides in the area that are asked um, to name them. So everyone puts some names together and then it's decided amongst them. And so it's very seldom has anything to do with us at Wild Earth. But this skittish male, no one's really taken any sort of positive approach to naming him. So I decided to be proactive about it about a week ago and um, asked all of the various lodges for their input and very few seem to really know who I was talking about which is astounding in its own right given that half of them have actually seen him um, and so then I decided well if no one wants to really give input there was one or two that did so I took their names and then we spoke to the Juma guides and so I said I'll give them a week to give some names and so I'm just waiting for them to give me some names and then from there basically We'll just sit down and we'll kind of go through what there is and see what we think and hopefully we'll be able to pick up a name that we all like and we'll discuss it a little bit and then we'll have a name for him and we'll tell all of you. How about that? So I'm hoping by 
what is today? Is today Saturday, Craig? Yes, let's say hopefully by Wednesday we should have a, a name nailed down, which should be quite nice. I, don't hold me to Wednesday, though. It might be Thursday, but we'll try and get it done by then in terms of... I also wanted to ask Herbie, and Herbie, unfortunately, has been booked off sick for quite a while. And so I've been waiting for him to come back as well, which he's back today. So try and kind of see what Herbie thinks as well. I always like to include as many of the Juma staff and, and or guiding and tracking team and when we do these kind of things, because ultimately, you know, it's their, it's their home area, it's their language. So always better for them to be able to do it. They're nice. Right, I'm going to head toward, well, I'm actually going to stay pretty close to Gallagher Pan. I'm just trying to catch up with these earliers that should be emerging um, fairly soon. And so while we do that, let's send you back across to Lauren, who's bumbling about. I am still bumbling. It's been a little bit quiet here. However, there is tracks everywhere for hyena. Now, obviously, Tristan and Steve have been speaking to you. Hold on a minute. About tracking, and it's. Mm, are those in Pala all. Hold on, I can just see someone pile off in the distance here because we believe there might be a leopard around somewhere. Um, and Pala are normally the key for giving them away. Normally when all the Impala are looking in the one direction, like what they're doing right now with such intensity, there could potentially be something there. Normally when they're not threatened or they haven't seen anything or nothing's caught their eye, you'll just see one looking and the rest will be feeding almost like a spotter. But all of these Impala just looked up at the exact same time and they're not looking at us. Okay, one is now. Hello. can see them all. A bunch of boys, a little bachelor hair here that are obviously done with the rutting. Oh, leopard, leopard, oh, leopard, sense here. Okay, I got a reverse, I got a leopard, I knew it. Oh, I'm sorry, that was really exciting. I got a bit excited here. Who is it? Man, I knew it, the Impala gave you away. Okay. Who are you? Who are you? Oh, my goodness, I'm so excited right now. Make the car roll down. Okay, Sainz was asking me to make the car roll down. There we go. Hey, I can't believe this. I just saw the Impala and I knew that something was going on. I'm just going to update the game drive radio. That's the proper etiquette here. All oh, right, actually, no, I'm going to remove the leopards going behind us, so bear with us. Now, of course, who are you? Right, I'm going to turn. I just need to make sure. <gasps> okay, this might take a little while, people. Are you good, Sans? I don't want to crash into my... Okay, let's follow this leopard walking along the road. I don't know who it is. I didn't get a proper look. Did you, Sans? Let's see. Okay, the leopard's up ahead. Sounds like just going to give you a little view here so we can see where this boy, it's definitely a boy, is going to head. And I will let the other radios know soon. Wow, what an incredible moment. You always have to look and listen and feel and sense what is going around you. And that is how you find the big animals such as leopards. Ah. There we go. Oh my goodness, it is Hosanna. That's what that's what Senzo said. I can't believe it. Thank you, James Richard. What a sighting. Yes. 
Oh my goodness, everybody. We're going to have to catch up with this boy somehow. But thank you everyone for jumping on board on this kids' drive. Please make sure you jump on with us again. See you then.